Good afternoon. Thank you for being with us today. My name is Bill Kelly. I am the Andrew W. Mellon Director of the New York Public Library's Research Libraries. Today, I have the great pleasure of speaking with Lewis Nelson about his new book, Mosaic War Monument Mystery. As many of you will surely know, Lewis is one of this country's leading designers. His work in strategic planning, storytelling, wayfinding, filmmaking, graphics, and product uh, design has informed in fundamental ways how we see and how we think. Among no many notable achievements in his career, uh, Mr. Nelson originated nutrition facts for the FDA, information which appears on almost all of America's food packages. You will be familiar with them, of course. He is the designer of the mural at the Korean War Veterans Memorial on the National Mall in Washington. And as I said, the author of Mosaic, that's the book we'll be discussing today. I won't anticipate or delay that conversation other than to say that Mosaic is a provocative and thoughtful meditation on war and memory that addresses a number of urgent contemporary concerns with clarity and with great eloquence. It's appropriate, I think, that we're having this conversation in the week in which we celebrate Veterans Day and as we continue our national conversation about memorials and cultural memory. By way of selfless, shameless self-promotion, you can borrow Mosaic from the library or buy it from the library shop. Proceeds, of course, benefit uh, New York Public Library. You can find links to get the book in the chat and at nypl.org slash live. Lewis has kindly put together a list of useful reading recommendations. Thank you for that, Lewis. That list is also on the event page. Um, I'd also note that there are many terrific programs coming up at live from NYPO, several offered in conjunction with the extraordinary New York uh, NYPO's Treasures exhibition. I urge you to visit the website for full details and urge you as well to visit the exhibition at the 42nd Street branch of the library. Finally, a few housekeeping details. The library, we all value your privacy, so we want you to know that even though the video and chat today are on the nypl.org page, they are hosted by YouTube, which enables people to see this across time. By participating in the chat, you may share detail or data about yourself, which the library does not control. We wanted to let you know that. Again, for more details on privacy matters, you can visit the event page. If you have questions for Lewis uh, in the course of this conversation, you can send them at any time using the chat function, Google form, or by emailing public programs, that's one word, public programs at nypl.org. Last, real-time captions are available for today's program. You can click on the closed caption button or use the stream text link shared in the reminder email and chat for a live, trans, uh, a live transcript. Now to the matter at hand. Lewis, are you joining me at this point? There he comes. Hello, Lewis. So nice Hi, to Bill. see you, sir. Good afternoon. Glad to Thank be here. You. I'm delighted to have you. Thank you so much for joining us today. Mosaic, I think, is a remarkable book. It's rich in resonance uh, in so many different ways, American history and our current cultural situation. Congratulations on this achievement and, and thank you for it. Thank you, Let sir. Let me begin, if I may, by asking you to remind us of the basic facts of the Korean War. You describe it as the seminal war of the 20th century, a conflict which, as you, in your words, pressed us into the future. Yet for many of us, it remains a ghostly presence in our collective consciousness, a war at once remembered and forgotten. Could you set the table for our conversation by reminding us about the basics of the Korean conflict? I'd be happy to. It, um, I guess uh, the elements that set it up basically were established in Yalta and in Potsdam. Uh, during the Second World War, along with setting up many of the other things that had happened uh, after the Second World War is over. 
Uh, primarily, uh, Korea was a nation that had been occupied by Japan. Japan was asked to vacate uh, Korea. And uh, because of the elements that would ha happen before, the, the northern part of Korea was going to be managed essentially by um, the Soviet, but actually was, I would say the Soviet Union, but not so much the Soviet Union, but eventually turned over to China and the southern part to the United Nations. And the United Nations principally um, managed by the United States. Uh, somewhere in, uh, in, the in, in, in the summer of 1950, um, North Korea, the, the people in North Korea uh, had decided that, or, the, or the, the, the people who were managing North Korea had decided that they wanted to see if we could, they could unify the country. And they had um, decided to- Excuse engage. me, the mail needs your attention. Excuse me, there's some things I just need to attend to. Sorry. That's okay, continue, please. And uh, so there was an invasion into, into, uh, into the South and it was a surprise. President uh, Harry Truman was president of the United States at the time and he well knew what the regulations and what the agreements were that were made in the various agreements between the, uh, the, the four contending uh, winners of the Second World War. And uh, th this was a violation, a major violation. And he was not very happy. So he decided to uh, support the South in, uh, in attending to that invasion. And there was a group of people he had sent in there, uh, GIs. Um, and at the same time, he sent his Secretary of State to the United Nations and asked the United Nations to uh, con condemn what the North had done and which they did. And it then became that we as a nation, United Nations, became an instrument of the of the United Nations at that time. So this was the first time that the United States had become involved with the United Nations. It was also the first time that we had uh, decided to uh, in, get involved with, in battle with the Red Chinese. And there were other firsts that came about because what, it was a difficult first, first element, you know, within a few days, the North was so, so involved and heavily uh, invested uh, and strong that they kind of went running through whatever the, our, our younger troops were there. So General MacArthur put an amphibian uh, invasion around the island and invaded Inchon and brought uh, peace, essentially a ceasefire. It was not a ceasefire, but essentially shoved the North back up into the North and uh, freed uh, Seoul, Korea. The, water, the war then proceeded for another, uh, another few months until it, it, uh, within nine months, so the story goes, both sides looked at each other, perhaps remotely from afar, and said, we should stop this. And they started to put the, 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 the programs together so that they could put together some sort of ceasefire. It took them over two and a half years to do that. So that by, uh, by again, the summer of 1953, a ceasefire was declared. There was going to be a, a peace, but the peace never happened. Uh, everyone walked away for all intents of the North walked away the South was there to sign, but there was nobody else to sign. So consequently, there was an agreement to cease fire, but that cease fire exists to this very day and there's no agreement of a peace. So consequently, Korea to this very day in 2021, there is the, the, the element of a war between these two countries. 
and there is ongoing hostility over that long period of time. At the very beginning, very little people, very few people in the United States knew where, where, where Korea was. Uh, they kind of knew where China was because China was an important part of the Second World War. And they knew where Russia was and certainly uh, uh, the other elements. And consequently, very few people understood. And also you have to bear in mind that the United States at that time, in 1950, was starting to feel the strength of a, of a, a recovered economy. People were traveling, people's, people, yeah, in, people's income was increasing, and people were having a generally a better, a better time than they were before that, but there was all kinds of other restrictions. That were. So consequently, uh, our attention was in other places. It was summertime, and the news was probably uh, of the things that occupied people's minds about summer. And, uh, and, and the joys. But consequently, we didn't know very much about North Korea. Over the period of time, North Korea uh, continued on along its way. South Korea also continued on along its way, which was more of a democratic way, and uh, went through various organizations to this very day. South Korea is a thriving, extraordinary success story of uh, of uh, developments and uh, uh, manufacturing. I think so many of the television sets that we enjoy here in the United States are manufactured in South Korea. And many of the automobiles of the South Korean economy come out in, uh, and you can see them on the roadways of in the United States. It's a thriving, uh, a thriving economy. And the people love the United States. The, men and women who served in the military to bring peace to Korea, 1950 to 1953, were so much the, vet the veterans of today, of then, who are the veterans of today, and um, are so enjoyed and, oh, the, what's the right word? The right word is so, in, in, uh, loved by the populace of South Korea, just absolutely amazing. If someone was an American into South Korea, they were honored. They, if you were a, a veteran at that particular time, you were hugged, uh, and it's an extraordinary uh, amount of success. Well, Lewis, let me, let, me, let me interrupt just for a second to ask sure. a question that occurs, that you talk about the uh, lack of attention in the U.S. to the war. Uh, prosperity, summertime, things are moving in different directions. But this war had huge human costs. I mean, the casualties were extraordinary, no? I mean, relative to, to Vietnam, for example, I mean, this is a war that lasted a briefer period of time and yet yielded, what, 38,000 American dead, not to mention the Korean casualties that were experienced. How, how, do, how does something that was that destructive fades so rapidly from, from memory and, uh, and a lack of attention to the cost of that conflict. We lost about 36,000 uh, American troops during, uh, during, during those three years. Uh, I, I guess you don't, you don't look at things at that time because this is 1950 to 1953. Uh, the war in, uh, in Europe and on, in Asia, the Second World War was an extraordinary war uh, of, uh, of death in all range. But this was, uh, this, this was low. I don't know if those numbers were really effectively communicated at that time though. It, doesn't, it isn't until later when we became further involved in Vietnam, which right. is the next war down the line, uh, which uh, obviously everybody pretty much knows that we walked away from, we had to walk away from. Uh, it was a war that we should probably have not have been in, and yet we lost there 58,000 people. But that 58,000 that we lost in Vietnam was probably over a 20 year period. Yeah. And, in, and in Korea, this 36,000 that we lost was over a three year period. So for the cost of the war per year, is extraordinary in Korea. 
We don't know that. Most of the American people don't know that. Right. They weren't in the streets marching with signs and saying out of Korea, right? I mean, this was a war that didn't surface. Let me let me take that point, if I may, sir, and say, okay, so for, the war happens, all of these deaths are caused. We see it as a seminal event in the future organizations of global arrangement, diplomacy, warfare, such. And then it's 40, more than 40 years later that that war is commemorated in the memorial. And I want to ask about the decision to build the memorial, why it took so long, what set off this process that, that yielded the, the memorial. But before we talk about that, I'd like our, our audience to take a look at the memorial itself for those who have not been able to see it or have not yet seen it in Washington. So I'm gonna ask Serena to show us some images from the, the, uh, the war. For those of you who are visually challenged, there's uh, information available on the website, but let me just describe it. First, we see the cover of, of Lewis's extraordinary book images, photographs that are etched into this wall. Um, we'll continue on with uh, other images. These are the 19 statues that Frank Gaylord, your collaborator, uh, prepared for the exhibition, ghostly figures for sure. And to their right is the wall that, that you designed. Next photo, if we could, Serena. Here's a close up of the wall. And I wanna ask you about the photographs, the faces, the images, why you chose them, how you chose them, the process of design. Next image, please, Serena. These again, pictures of, this, of the Gaylord sculptures of combatants in the war, sort of emerging out of uh, uh, the ground, out of and ghost like for me, incredibly haunting. And again, the wall to the left. Next image, if we, if we can, Serena. This again, I mean, this one with snow on the ground and of course appropriate for that war, at least in certain stages, fought in extraordinary uh, bad temperature. Uh, Serena, the next one, please. And here again, a long shot of the wall that Lewis designed and created. So I'm gonna stop the images. I think again, you can find them on the website if you wanna see further. Lewis, tell us about the decision to build the war more than 40 years after, again, as you said, it never ended, but after ceasefire, uh, dedication in 1995, war ends in, or at least ceasefire begins in 53. Why so long first? And second, what was the process that resulted in building it? Who was pushing this? How did it happen? And then I'm going to ask you about how you got involved in the design challenges you confronted. Some of the, uh, those, those are good worthwhile questions. And uh, Bill, the, the, I, I, the movement to put a memorial uh, to the Korean War, I think is in large part about the result of a number of very dedicated veterans who put, who put the issues together and wrote the materials very strongly and went to Congress and got the permission from Congress and a number of the probably congressmen there were also veterans of Korea as well, and thought it was worthwhile to do that. However, that kind of happened somewhat in relationship because Vietnam, the Vietnam um, uh, veterans had started a, an initial program as well for the Vietnam Memorial. Uh, so, uh, you know, it gets become, it gets become it be competitive in a certain way, and I dare not get into that part of the story. So that Vietnam became more realized and, and, and before, the Vietnam, before the Korean War became realized. So Vietnam is built. And, if you, if, and they decide because of the nature of the, of, of, of the grounds available at the National Mall, that if you're a Lincoln and everyone who kind of knows Lincoln who stands at the end of, of the National Mall and looks out uh, further across the reflecting pool to the Washington Monument. If he puts your left hand out, that's where the Vietnam Memorial is. And to the right hand, 
you put the right hand out, that's where the Korean War veterans are. When, when it was decided somehow or another, one thing led to another and I became involved. I was asked to make a presentation to the, uh, to, to the board. Uh, and uh, I talked to them about how, what, the, what the war was like from my point of view, because it, it, the war had affected certain decisions that I had made in my life. Now, this is well beyond. This is in 1990, uh, when we started work on the design of the memorial. Uh, some 30 years before, uh, 30 years later, um, and uh, I'm I'm of another of another age. I'm not a young. I'm not a younger man, but I've, I'm an accomplished designer at the time. Um, we decide then at that time. Uh, as I'm looking around that are my neighbors are essentially the Vietnam Memorial. And we certainly don't want to do something similar to Vietnam, nor Lincoln, nor Washington. So my big prim principal uh, neighbors are those three major memorials. And yet when I think more about it at that time, before I even knew what Congress wanted, I thought that we have to be very selective and very different than what is being achieved at those three other memorials. Well, Congress you're, right, decided, you're right, Lewis, about the challenge of being in conversation with these other monuments, memorials, and different ways in which we honor service. Lincoln with a kind of physical presence, Lincoln as representative, the Vietnam War with the names of the combatants, Washington, this kind of classical obelisk and symbol of, of his achievements. You chose faces. Um, why did you choose faces as a way of honoring service and evoking memory? Well, I have to give credit in a certain way to Congress because Congress thought having gone through some of the problems that the Vietnam Memorial had gone through. Remember, the Vietnam Memorial was probably one of the most successful memorials that the United States had built because it brought together and healed a nation that was an extraordinary split. Some agreed, to, some disagreed that we should be there or not. So, uh, it, and it was basically a list of the names of those who had, had given their lives. Um, when I think about traditional ways of commemorating and remembering uh, memorials, uh, there, there's, there's maybe four or five different ways of doing it. One is, the, is usually a list of names. And we've seen that you know, in, in, the great, in, the, in the great churches that are in the uh, seafaring countries and so forth, where you see the names of those who have died on some of the ships that have not come back from the quest out in the ocean. Uh, another, another way that we do things is to you know, build a statue to a great man. And certainly that was Lincoln and the effects that, uh, and how he had operated uh, as a president during a time of great, great tragedy in the Civil War. And another way is to build an abstract representation that would represent us the service of another kind of individual. And that was the Washington Monument. So we have the Washington Monument, the Vietnam Memorial, and the Lincoln Memorial. And I thought that there's only really one other way of commemorating service, and that everybody does, and everybody does this. And you take a photograph of a loved one and put it on your mantelpiece. So I decided I wanted the mural to essentially be photographs of all those that served in Korea and represented everybody that served in Korea, not who died, but who served in Korea. So one thing, and, and I, I made that proposal to the, to the board. The board absolutely agreed, totally. General Stilwell said, terrific. He said, just put their faces in, maybe a hat. Maybe if you needed something to tell them what, tell everybody what they did, you can put a wrench in their fit. 
So we've got faces on the wall that represent the Army, Navy, Marines, and the Coast Guard and the Air Force. And we've got uh, in those faces, we have individuals who were serving as cooks and nurses and doctors and airplane pilots and bombardiers and uh, truck drivers and tank drivers and uh, who, who covered the entire range, the uh, people who were landing officers on aircraft carriers. So that it represents everybody as far as the category is concerned. And it got to a point that I thought as we were doing it, I wanted this to be as real as possible, that all of these photographs are taken by Army and Navy military photographers in Korea between 1950 and 1953, that these would represent all those people that served. So consequently, I wanted them all to be anonymous. So those people that we have on the wall, they're real people that served their real, but they represent everybody. But Men, you women. The decision war. not to include the weapons of war by and large. Uh, these faces that are so haunting as one looks at the wall are different from, uh, from the memorials that have howitzers and cannons and guys carrying guns and that. How did you come to that decision? I think it was a genius decision, but did you well, have a you difficulty what, I, selling I, I, that? Let's tell the story. Uh, we, you know, we, 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 there's, there's a the Commission of Fine Arts or the people that kind of pass on whether our design is going to be welcomed or not welcomed or done, or not done. But, and we were right on the verge of being approved. There was something that had happened and I'll lead you as quickly as I possibly can. We had a war that went on in Iraq. Uh, and uh, we won that war in a relatively short period of time. General Schwarzkopf, you know, came back from Iraq was there for a number of days. Uh, we had a great success, and there was a there was a a, a a victory parade down Fifth Avenue in New York City. They wanted to do something similar in Washington D.C. Um, we had uh, therefore they put all kinds of howitzers and tanks and uh, helicopters and all kinds of other gunnery out on the National Mall, and the. Word that we got from the from the uh, people who were directing uh, the uh, Fine Arts Commission is that the American people, or at least the people in Washington D.C., were not very happy to see all the implements of war so close. And so they were very concerned, and we had Frank Frank Gaylord, an extraordinary sculptor, who sculpted these nineteen major. Uh, statues of, the, of uh, Army, Navy, and uh, Marines in the, in, in the, in the grouping. Um, had, uh, they were carrying what was called the M1 rifles or a carbine at the time, so you could see them. And the, the Fine Arts Commission thought that they would not have to, they would not approve our final design. The moment I said that, I heard that, I, I went to Frank and I said, Frank, Let's put ponchos around these soldiers so that it covers the guns and at the same time provides the way where a breeze could show some sort of flow so that there was some connection between all these 19 soldiers. Frank said, great, let's do it. He, we made a little mock-up. We showed it to the Fine Arts Commission. They agreed. And we were on our way. That was not Terrific. a crisis. That, that is a great story. And the interpenetration of past and present, which is one of the great uh, virtues of the book. I mean, that the ways in which the Iraqi conflict or Storm and Norman or whatever informed our memory of the past and how we represent it is, is fascinating to me. You say in talking about these decisions and the remembering of service, and I love them the image of everyone having photos on their mantles and on their desks. And that is a way of, of an objective correlative for loss and memory, beautifully done. But you also say that a memorial heals. And my question is, what does a memorial heal? And how does it do it? You talk about touching the soul and stimulating the imagination. 
But what do you mean when you say a memorial heals? And what does this memorial heal for a war that essentially ended 40 some years before you built it? How does it heal? Well, one of the things that I wanted to, I, what the faces would, would relate to me was that, because I, I investigated, I looked back at all the faces that I could gather together, you know, whether it was the Civil War or whether it was the, written, the, the imagery that was painted in earlier wars, World War I, uh, other wars in Germany. And, and the nature of, the, of a face is, you know, it, 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 relatively simple, two eyes, a nose, mouth, and so forth. I, I selected that we wanted these to be kind of benign faces, not necessarily happy faces, not angry faces, uh, not faces in pain, but faces that look resolute, let's just say. Um, they, they, they are somewhat similar for all those wars. The only thing that changes is what they wear, and what's on their head and so forth. So there's something in my mind as well that those faces would be an indication to anyone who's going to be visiting the war, the memorial today, or visiting it 10 years from now, or five years from now, or next, next month, or 20 years from now. And they would see that those faces look similar to the faces of what their neighbors look like. And in that process, they realize something that the nature of service is very universal. Coupled with that, I was also thinking that who knows how, 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 how people commemorate and how, how they heal. Sometimes you heal by talking about things and sometimes you heal by spending time. The important thing about a memorial is that you have, you have to go there. Otherwise, if you don't go to a memorial, there's no memorial. So usually you go there, a lot of people go there and they see something and they may walk away from it. I've gotten notes back from teenagers that say that they like this memorial, they think that they, that they, can, they can relate to it because there's a sense of humanity here. The other part of the story, um, it was, and I, and I think I probably have told you this, that I, I didn't know some of the things that had happened. So the executive director of the memorial in, in an event that I had attended about a month or two ago said, Lewis, you know, you're not here all the time, so you may not know this, but we get a lot of people who come from South Korea. And uh, in this particular case, this unit came in, group of people who were visitors, who were on a tour. These are South Koreans, and they're usually of an older age. They come to the memorial, the, the Korean War Veterans Memorial, directly from Korea, first thing. They don't go to their hotel. And in this particular group, there were maybe 30 or 40, maybe 50 people. They, got, they went to where the wall is. And the wall is 140 feet long. And they all lined up on the wall. Maybe a couple of people went over and stood next to one of the statues. They took their shoes off. They kneeled in some prostrate and they prayed. And I was broken up. When I heard that, because I never had thought that something like that would happen. It's, it, it has extraordinary power. I mean, Lewis just said the wall is how many feet long, Lewis? 130? 140 feet long. 140, and then it ranges from six to 12 feet high. And these images, so 2,000 faces, is that correct? Or am I getting that number? Probably 20, it, it, it's probably, I think we, we stopped counting at, at around 2,400. So it's probably over 2,500 faces. And, and you, you stand, stand all chosen from, you know, the, I had researchers digging into uh, the Air and Space Museum and the National Archives and so forth, uh, probably tens of thousands of photographs that we chose. It's, it's extraordinarily powerful, just as you, you've described, uh, overwhelming, really, and the faces carry that, that power. Let me ask a somewhat, you know, the other side of the coin difficult question. When, I mean, monuments heal, as you've just described, but what happens when monuments wound rather than heal? A lot of the debate about particularly Confederate monuments and the removal of statues that are uh, triggers for pain having to do with slavery or having to do with the end of Reconstruction or having to do with the late 
construction of these monuments in the 20th century as a way of uh, reinforcing white supremacy. What about monuments that don't heal? Is there a place for them? Uh, is, are these teaching moments? Are these monuments that are counter to the healing process you've just described? What's your thought about that debate? It, it's a difficult subject. Uh, and I don't necessarily think I have the right answer. I don't know if there is a right answer. I think that the right, uh, probably the right answer in many cases are if people who in the great majority believe that they are, that they're in the presence of an inappropriate, an inappropriate symbol based on their history and what, uh, what, uh, and what had happened to them. Then it becomes inappropriate. Oh, that's a deep. Yep. As you say, a tough question, and, and, but, but I, there, I'm down there, in that place. Go ahead. There are, there are pros and cons to that. There are some people that don't agree. They think that it's important to respect history and that, that, that there, is, there is value in history. Yeah. But it depends on where the, how the history lends it, lends itself. Yeah. I, I think we're probably talking about the things that, that, that happened during the Civil War that we've been faced with, yeah. with a lot of discussions and so forth. Yeah, I mean, it, it comes to, I mean, your discussion of how monuments heal has reframed that issue for me. It's certainly not an easy one, but when one thinks about the power of monuments like the Korean uh, War Veterans Memorial, to create that moment of healing. And then one thinks about the ways in which other monuments open wounds. Uh, it's, a, it's a powerful dichotomy to, to work through. Apropos barriers and, and dichotomies, let me ask you about walls. I mean, as you say, if you're standing with your back to Lincoln and on your left hand, you have the Vietnam wall and on the right, you have the Korean veterans wall. Um, talk to me a little bit about why walls are appropriate monuments why you chose to do this. And let me sort of frame that by thinking about your personal history uh, that you talk about in the book so so well. You were a helicopter pilot in Germany during the Berlin Wall crisis and, and, and thereafter. What's your conception about walls, the function of walls and memorials? How do, I know you've thought a good deal about this. Talk to us a little bit about the decision to build a wall that is across from another wall and the conversation that it orchestrates between Maya Lin's wall and Lewis Nelson's wall. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, that was, a, that was a spaghetti, a plate full of spaghetti no, at the no, question, no, I'm sorry. Those, those, are, those are deep, uh, deep-seated uh, issues, I think, having to do with uh, my, my view, about there have been all kinds of walls that I've put up. You know, I've designed exhibitions and uh, in which I want people to come into an exhibition and I want them to know what's, you know, on a wall, there's the, the subject of an exhibition and then various details of whether it's an individual or whether it's an event that had happened. Uh, but in many cases, I, I know you, you can't deal with all the people in the right amount of time. So consequently, you have to provide as a designer a way for people, a way for them to get access to satisfy that their need, their needs. So there's some situations where they will bypass the, the entrance so that the exhibition at the middle, you kind of have to in, introduce the subject as well and uh, give them some, give the people some value of, of it. So there's got to be places to get through, um, yep. you know. And so that it's it's like the crack where the light goes through. And someone very popular had said something to that effect. Uh, some of the time, and sometimes the wall uh, also carries then the subject of it. And sometimes it has it's not necessarily permanent. It can be very transitory and very uh, impermanent. If you look at the look at the walls that were erected after 9/11 here in the United, here in New York City, I mean the what we had lists of people and photographs of people who were looking for their relatives who was in the towers and built you know taped onto uh, picket fences uh, in uh, in in Greenwich Village 
uh, that became walls and just extraordinary you know, impromptu representations. A wall doesn't necessarily have to be something that is physical. It can also be uh, things that we provide mementos to, like flowers and, uh, and, and, and a lot of people, at, in, in, particularly in Vietnam, had left mementos, they left flowers, they left uh, badges, they left medals uh, that their uh, brother is giving or they that they received that they felt that they should be giving to an ally who was there. So they leave those things. So the wall becomes a repository of memories. And I think that we heal through that interaction of being someplace, giving ourselves the time to be at that place. And a place doesn't necessarily have to be then at that time. We can walk away from memorial and be at that memorial because we had that experience a year from now and so forth. And all of a sudden, one understands better about themselves and where they can go so that the memorial doesn't necessarily mean anything about the structure or the design or the materials that are used, but what happens to affect change in the feelings of an individual. And yeah, that beautiful, is beautiful. Beautifully said, Lois. Let me, I mean, stay on the question of um, the personal uh, and the personal response to the wall that you just touched on. Mosaic is an appropriate title for this book. I mean, it's part history, part memoir, part design history our national history, and all of these pieces are put together, as Mosaic would suggest, but through the eye of uh, an extraordinarily accomplished designer. Can you talk a little bit about the Mosaic form of the book and the ways in which you use the personal, not as a self-portrait, but as a lens in seeing the world through the, your own experience? How did you come to that kind of design judgment rather than straight on narrative, this was the wall, this is what we did, this is how I worked with Gaylord, this, this, this is what finally happened. How did you imagine and why turning this, using your own experience as a lens to talk about these deep-seated cultural issues? It, it, um, I learned something along the way and I learned it from a, a couple of people. Uh, I learned it from reading a lot. I mean, as a designer, and because of my, and how I was brought up and my, the nature of my family, we didn't read a lot of books. Um, my father was an electrical engineer. Uh, we were lower middle class, you might say, and he, he didn't make a lot of money. He didn't even finish high school. And yet he was able to become a, 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 an engineer and. Uh, designed some of the major things that were used on, by the Navy during the Second World War. Uh, so that uh, things were not in, in many ways, weren't available to uh, us in, in some, television was just on the, on the verge of being understood. Uh, so I started my career essentially designing book covers in fourth or fifth grade uh, reading book covers because I got some extra credit if, they, if I would, if I did that and they were put up on a bulletin board. So I kind of liked that idea. So vanity was a little bit about it as well. As I decided to start to write, you know, as a designer, uh, I had, I, I had decided, started to write poetry. Uh, in 1994, 95, at the, toward the end of the, when, we were finishing up the design of the, of the memorial. And uh, eventually some other people at 9-11 happened. There were some writings about that memorials should happen because of 9-11. And I thought most of the people that were writing about memorials really didn't understand what memorials were about. Not that I should understand so much because I just had felt that it wasn't right. And I started writing then. And I had to, I, I, I found that my writing wasn't as uh, how I really liked it. I learned a lot, 
I read all of Bob Carroll's stuff. I read all of my wife's stuff, who, who was a noted poet and songwriter, uh, singer. Um, I read a lot of other things from other people. And then it got to a point where I, after I had all this writing, I, I asked for some help with an editor. I gave my editor around 300 pages. The editor gave me 30 pages back. <laughs> <laughs> The important thing she said, she said, you have to tell me why this subject is important to you. Ah. And that was the signal. I had, and I, it was a lot of soul, soul searching to me is to try to figure out that. So things that I had experienced and walked through and so forth, all of a sudden the things that I liked, the things I didn't like became important things to tell people about and why and how it's important. And why it's important because if it's usually important to me, it's important to other people. Yeah. Um, that's very good. That's good advice. Let me ask about this week, Veterans Day. I mean, I, this is a personal peak of mine. Why it was a bad idea to move from Armistice Day, which was what it was always designated as, the eleventh hour of the eleventh day of the eleventh month the celebration of World War I and the coming of peace and all that's embedded in armistice as opposed to Veterans Day. And that's on Thursday. And I think in the same way that we sometimes want to forget conflicts, particularly conflicts that seem in the distant past or we don't want, as you were saying about Iraq, see tanks rolling down the streets. It's, it is important, I think, to remember. Can you give me some sense of, of the difference in your mind between Veterans Day and Armistice Day and what this day we are about to celebrate, probably the wrong verb, commemorate on Thursday. You've worked with veterans. You worked with veterans groups. You've worked with military people. You yourself spent time uh, in, in the army. Can you talk a little bit about the resonance of that day? Let me tell you, you know, the, the Korean War, I didn't realize it uh, that, until I really started thinking about this, when, you know, at some advanced, advanced age. The Korean War, when I was in, it was, happened when I was going to high school, and I, did, I had no sense of it whatsoever. And yet, in 1954, I started college. And my first year in college, I went to Pratt Institute. I'm very happy to have been there. It's an extraordinary, I was extraordinarily lucky uh, to choose that place. Um, I, I uh, about 20, 20, probably 20 or 30% of the class that started with me were Korean War veterans. And I look back at it at a particular time and I realized that they were a few years older than all of us. We were high school kids. Uh, and, but these guys knew what they wanted and they knew what, what, how they were gonna get it. They worked very hard. They raised the standard of, of design, the standard of academic uh, uh, intelligence, let's just say for my entire class. We are far better off because of these vets. Thank you. I think that there's an, and, and they were all over in Korea. They may or may not have seen battle, uh, but that was the story about it. And I, I decided to draw, I decided to enter ROTC because I needed a way to assure that the draft was on and I wasn't going to get drafted and that my education was going to be continuous. So I was very lucky there and not to go beyond that point. There's also a, something very important, I think, in the nature of armistice and the terminology of armistice day and the terminology of what that was in World War I. Uh, an extraordinarily hostile war. And many people today look at World War I and World War II, the historians, some historians look at it, particularly some of the historians at the Army War College that I was talking about, look at that as really a continuous war uh, because of whatever they think. The, the issue was that 
there's something important about maintaining the reality and the purpose of, of history. So I, I wasn't so sure that I could really think that the best thing in the world is to really change the name of the veterans. But I think that happened largely under Eisenhower when he was president. He thought it, it brought the change, if, I, if I'm re recollecting this properly. And he had a different view of what the value of a veteran was because there was the, it was those people who served during the Second World War that won the war. Got it. Thank you. So there is, I think it takes a broader kind of view to, to view it. I, I have no problem with it. I'm going to be down there. I've been asked to, I've been asked to lay a wreath at veterans, and I do it willingly. Yeah. We've got a number of questions from audience members. Let me ask you a few of those, if, you, if you're if kind enough to, to answer them. Um, the first one, I think you've already addressed. How did your time in the military impact you as an artist and designer? anything further? I mean, you've just talked about that, uh, but uh, is there anything further you'd want to say about I spent I, I spent nearly five years, probably a little over four years of, in the military. I chose certain things to do because I felt that they were important. I mean, I learned to be a helicopter pilot. I learned, I, 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 uh, the things I learned because of the military made me a better designer because I, I was able to get, I was able to understand that we got to complete things on time, that we've got to be within budget, all of those other kinds of things that become very important. Uh, and that there are ways of making things distinctly and different uh, in relationship to this. You write that, that one of the lessons that you learned as a designer was simple things matter. And I think that also comes from uh, that experience you just described, and it sure plays out in, in positive ways in the work that you've done. Another question, is there anything about your design that you would change if you were creating it today? Um, maybe at a couple of places, I would have added a few more faces. <laughs> this is a question for me. Did you have any pushback from the committee and Congress and the military oh, okay. on terms of, of, of any know, of this? I, I, I had an extraordinary relationship with the, 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 the general who was in charge of the foundation, with General Stilwell. And he died uh, the Christmas of the uh, 1990. 1990. Uh, so we, I only had a short period of time with him. He was extremely uh, impressed with uh, what my suggestion was. It's very, it's nice to have a relationship with somebody who agrees with. Who gets it? Yeah. So it makes life a lot easier. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't happen all that often, but nice when it does. However, he, he the, some of the board, you know, after his death, they, they were really interested in showing guns and they were interested in showing uh, tanks and they were interested in showing aircraft and so forth. And they were in it's insistent on it. So I decided I couldn't fight them. I, I, but I, I, do, I, worked, I, worked a, I worked those objects into it in a certain way that they would not be so important. I did not want to make this. You know, they came to me with the whole idea that this was going to be in my way of thinking. A army and navy recruiting person. This is not an army and navy recruiting. You're fading a little bit, Lewis. If you could move into the speaker. I'm sorry, they came to me with the idea that 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 I interpreted was that this was going to be an army and navy recruiting post, but that's not what. That's not. No, what no, decidedly not. There's another question, a related question, asking what reaction you received from veterans, and I assume that means not simply veterans of Korea who are a, a small remainder, but of veterans in general to the wall and their response. You talked about the Korean visitors. Two, what two about veterans? Two or three things I can really mention as briefly as I can. One, one is that some of them said, I can smell the smoke. Some of them said, I look at the wall and I can feel the freezing weather. 
But the important one was uh, on dedication day, uh, I walked there with Judy and this fellow ran up to me and somehow or another saw me coming and somehow or another knew what I knew, knew me. And he thanked me and he said, he's, uh, he's probably uh, the age that is uh, a little bit older than me at that particular time. He said, for the first time, because of what you've done, I understood what had happened to me and now I can talk about it. Wow, that's power. Lewis, thank you. This has been an extraordinary conversation. I thank our audience for participating. There are all of those various housekeeping things that are, can, if you want to revisit are on the, on, uh, on the page site. Uh, this conversation will be placed in our archive, available on YouTube, available through the library. And I'm just so happy and proud to have you with us and to have this conversation. So okay. thank you. Can I just say something? I'm proud to be here. And I'm delighted that you had asked me to do this. And I'm honored that, uh, that, that, the, that the library itself would be allowed this to happen. So Wonderful. To totally. Thank you. And I urge Mosaic upon all of you. I've read it twice now and have, have profited mightily from it. So thank you, Lewis. Thank you all. A good day to you. Bye-bye. Thank you for joining us. For more information and to register for upcoming programs, visit nypl.org live.